very excited to introduce Vanessa Henry. She is another badass chick, and I'm super excited for her to explain um, who's watching The Watchers. It's a great question. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Thank you for organizing this conference, which um, I, and, and by the way, I feel I got the disclaimer because I, I'm a lawyer, so I feel like I prompted Eddie to do the disclaimer just before, um, but thank you so much for having me. I think this is uh, a great initiative about privacy and equity, and I picked a topic that I think uh, maybe I wouldn't have picked in another conference because I thought... You know why? This this is a good uh, opportunity for us to reflect together. And I actually purposely uh, kept my slide um, quite, uh, how would I say, quite empty because I want to leave it for you to actually interact with me about cybersecurity and surveillance. And the topic of this talk is really about who is watching the watcher. Um, before I joined, I, well, before I started my own law firm, which is uh, Henry and Wolf, uh, I've been into big law, I've been into big cybersecurity, international firm, um, and without naming names, I have seen so many times uh, vendors selling something that they don't have themselves, right? Selling you uh, the Cadillac of governance where they barely have uh, their own information security policy in place. Or I've seen, um, I have seen also uh, law firms selling all kinds of uh, uh, contracts and requirement where they don't even have their own general counsel. So I started to ask myself, uh, who are these people we're trusting? to protect us. And I won't get too much in the political here because right away you will see if you follow the money, who owns who, and you, if, unless you've been living in a cave, I'm sure you have heard about the acquisition of Mendian by Google and that has raised many eyebrows, right? I had people say, well, that's gonna give credibility to Google or that's gonna remove credibility from Mendian or that's going to add to conflict of interest, right? Um, but I, I think there's something happening around the cybersecurity industry that we're not talking about. And we, and I'm sure you heard that before as well. Uh, we are in the middle of a cyber war. So if you're, if you're accessing the internet, you're actually in a cyber war. So I, I start to ask myself, so is cybersecurity the next military complex? Are we actually uh, buying? Are we buying dual-use uh, software when we're trying to protect ourselves? And, and what does that mean uh, in terms of privacy? Uh, would I want uh, the military complex to look at my business, never mind my employees or my children? So, really, the topic that we will be discussing today is. What is the fine line between surveillance and cybersecurity? And, and why does it get scary where that line is blurred? And how do we make sure that it doesn't happen? And the first topic I want to tackle on, and I will keep that relatively short because I do hope to have some feedback about this to answer some question. And I do hope that it will make you think uh, this is not a presentation where I will answer the question for you. Of course not. I'm a lawyer. I'm going to tell you it just depends, right? <laughs> but this is really a presentation where I would like us to reflect as a society, how do we make sure that our desire to protect our data doesn't turn into a double-edged sword where we are building surveillance tools that can be exploited not only by government entities, but also by the very hackers that we're trying to leave out of our system. So the first thing is really about predictive cybersecurity. I've been working with AI for a very long time, and I thought that this was the first red flag for me when it came to me and somebody said, um, I'm going to be able to predict cybersecurity. So my, my, my first question was, what are these data requirements? Oh, are you going to be able to predict cybersecurity if not by... Uh, taking a lot of behavior data and behavior data that you're going to collect through logs, but to what else? To what I type on my computer? To the time at which I, I log in? Maybe to the type of files I access? 
how much time I need to do this. So think about it. So if I want to know, is this Vanessa writing that contract? And Vanessa usually writes a contract in two hours. But I had a bad day and I've been crying all day and it hasn't been good. So I take four hours. Does that make me a cyber criminal anymore? And does that mean that my performance data becomes cybersecurity? And then I will get a phone call saying, Vanessa, we locked you out of the law firm because somebody's using your account because they're not working like you're usually working. And what kind of pressure does that, does that create on the worker? And what does that mean from a privacy standpoint? And then that feeds into interactive use, right? A predictive cybersecurity requires being actual. So it requires an ongoing and continuous surveillance of the system. It requires understanding what is normal and what is abnormal. So it requires that somebody decides what is normal behavior. And what does that mean in terms of society when we decide what is a normal behavior and what kind of societal norms are we creating and what kind of impacts do we have on the employee? So all of this is scary enough on its own because uh, there's a lot of questions to ask there. But when it gets scarier is what are the watchers doing with all of this? Who's going to audit this cybersecurity company to make sure that there's no secondary use, right? And to make sure that there's no disclosure to third party. So here's my favorite example, data loss prevention tool. How will these tools work? They will actually work by collecting data from your emails. From my emails are protected by attorney client privilege. There is going to be a third party tool that will go through this email and look for pre-selected words. Here's an example, trade secrets, um, you know, all kinds of things that lawyers use in every single communication. So that means that data loss prevention will raise all kinds of alert due to the nature of my work or that somebody will have to closely look at everything I do to make custom room for me. And that data loss prevention is extracting this in order to raise flags. And where is it? Where is that company located? And where are their third party located? Going up that chain of data loss prevention, I have found that actually some of these logs were, were sent to country like China. The issue with that is that data loss prevention is often used to protect trade secrets. So the idea of data loss prevention is you're not going to send the trade secrets to country that will not protect it. And China is one of these rogue countries lately that have been flagged. But if your data loss prevention tool is actually sending it on its own, then don't even worry about trade secret being stolen because you do, you're purposely sending that information. So the first thing that we have in terms of concerns here is that cybersecurity company that will take your predictive cybersecurity data that you will feed to it in the hope of protecting your business and then will make a disclosure to a country where it shouldn't. And then from there on, we will be able to take all of these data and understand your trade secret. We will maybe be able to do secondary use. So I've looked at so many contracts with cybersecurity company. How many of them actually prevents them to do secondary use? Most of them at best have a data model in which the company will own aggregated data and sometimes even anonymized data. I still have to see provision that shape when and how they can anonymize your predictive cybersecurity data. So what that means is that there is a maybe a data lake or a data warehouse, but there's definitely a bunch of data somewhere about your business that may or may not have retention period because are you auditing your cybersecurity company? Most of the time you're not. And not only is that dangerous to getting act, but that's dangerous because it can be requested by government. Government can make a government access request to your logs that you've given to your managed security service provider can make a request to access your data loss prevention data. And from there on, 
they will be able to have the same vision on your company than, a, than your cybersecurity firm. So what is surveillance? Surveillance is the monitoring of behavior, activities, information, we gather information, but for why? To influence, manage, or direct. Whereas cybersecurity is about protection. It does not have an intent other than protecting. It doesn't have an hidden agenda, but surveillance does. Surveillance has an hidden agenda. And that's the line between surveillance and between cybersecurity. And if you don't watch the watchers the way they're supposed to be watched, that line is easily crossed because what you're doing is you literally creating a big log about your business, handing it over to third party that have no accountability and allowing government to freely ask for all that data. We have seen it with clouds and we know that. We know that this is an issue with cloud security. We know that because there's the Cloud Act, there has been that old discussion between the US and the EU. But do we know about the cybersecurity firm? And now what do you think from that perspective was the end goal of Google acquiring Mendent? And what do you think that means when we say Fire Eyes is very close, tie our relationship with government? What does that mean when we say that a smaller cybersecurity firm does not have governance, does not have retention? It means that we are, through our cybersecurity effort, opening the door wide open to surveillance. And that's when we say the road to hell is paved with good intention. And my message in this, uh, I think we should, we should even call it a TED Talk. My message in that little TED Talk is be careful who you're working with. And cybersecurity shouldn't come at all costs. Definitely not at the cost of cybersecurity. And definitely not at the cost of your trust that you've been building with your stakeholder. And that's when I really want to touch base on the modern workforce. Because that's what we are at Henry and Wolf. We are a community of professionals working in cooperation together. And we've set up a system to make sure we stay not only safe through, let's say, Ubiquis and the like, but also a trust-based system where we can trust each other. And that's the modern workforce. That's how we make sure that we have talents that can actually bring something different. That's how we make sure we have diversity of thoughts because we have people in different jurisdictions. And that's also how we make sure that we have good threat intelligence because we have a follow the sun model where we have people in different areas that hear a different thing, think differently, and are available at different hours. That's the modern workforce. So how much personal data do you want to connect, collect for that modern workforce to work? And what are the expectations of privacy of these employees? And in a group of company, what does that mean? I have audited several group of companies and they all share something in common, which is a complete misunderstanding of all personal data are shared within the group. So you will have a division that will be better at accounting that will be over there. So they will do the payroll. Uh, and this division may actually have a subcontractor that's in under the division. And down the line, we are not able to get to the end of the chain of the transfer of all the personal data of the modern workforce. So we have two trends here. People want to have more freedom, and there's a big return on that from businesses. But people also have expectations of privacy that cybersecurity doesn't want to respect because we have a perception that if somebody is not into an office, that person is a danger. And because of that, we're going to do more cybersecurity. And when it comes down to a group of company, it means we're going to do more and more international transfer. And we come to the conclusion that there is a loss of control. And when there's a loss of control, we see it generally at the ecosystem level. So you have an ecosystem, here is the modern workforce. But I've seen loss of control into construction website because there's so many third parties right? The modern workforce is a new ecosystem full of third party, 
full of individuals and businesses and entities and departments and divisions and establishments and the personal data is going all over. So then we, how do we react human as loss of control? We don't like it. We want, we want control. We want to understand. So what do we do? We monitor and we monitor and we risk going into surveillance. And what that means ultimately for, um, for the employees, it means that they live in a system of surveillance. They live in a system where, um, where, where everything is collected about them and we lose the notion of trust. And trust should be not our first principle to make sure that we don't go from cybersecurity to surveillance. This is because trust is the difference. I don't do surveillance of a country that I trust. I do surveillance of a country that I do not trust. And if we are able to maintain that principle of trust to transparency, to privacy, then we will be able to maintain that distinction between surveillance and cybersecurity. We also need cybersecurity company to understand that, understand the responsibility that they have to maintain that line, understand the conflict of interest they can walk into, and understand what is a dual use under export control. So we have uh, cybersecurity companies are very eager to serve government. So what does that mean on the long term, that a cybersecurity serve government and my data end up being in the same um, maybe cloud environment? What are the risks of that? And do I want my data to inform other clients? So should a cybersecurity company be allowed to use the data of company A, B, and C to create an aggregated data that's going to inform company D? Should they be allowed or is that, um, is that revealing of what's happening into the industry? And today, I do not see data models being in place uh, within cybersecurity company. They do not have that. This is aggregated data. This is anonymized data. This is personal data. This, you know, can be mixed. This cannot be mixed. And these are the purpose for which we're using it. If you go around your cybersecurity service provider and you ask these questions, you will get very random and inconsistent answer to this. There is no data format either that is standard into the cybersecurity industry. So when I work with EdTech, so education technologies, they have standard on what kind of data can be collected, how they ensure the compatibility between the tools and what is too much and what is not too much and what is retention. So why can education do it, but not cybersecurity? And as a privacy professional, are we focusing maybe a little too much on marketing and maybe not enough on what's going on on the IT side of things? Are we knowledgeable enough of cybersecurity and IT in order to apply our expertise into the specific demand? So the retention of data obviously is the main issue, but also the lack of you know, we don't like to look at ourselves in the mirror. It's very easy to point at others. We're very good at telling others what to do. But will we take the time to do ourselves what we need to do first to establish the trust that we need with the stakeholder so that they know that we are protecting them and that we're not actually monitoring them? And I don't see that today in the, in the market. So my little speech was really about how do I make sure that the road to L is not paved with good intention. And it's really a call for all the privacy professional out there. Tomorrow, take a little bit of time and just make the list of all the third party that have access to your data for cybersecurity purposes. Never mind that GDPR says that that's a legitimate interest. Just go further into it. Is that really a legitimate interest? Or is that, does GDPR mean blanket legitimate interest? Or does it mean you still have to check? And what I find in practice is most of us are not checking. We take for granted that security is always a legitimate interest. So today, uh, if you have one key takeaway, if you don't know the list of third party that are used for cybersecurity, try to know it. And from there on, build your way up. Understand where is that going in the world? Who are these companies? Who do they work with? 
and what kind of procedure they have in place to avoid conflict of interest and to protect your data from governmental access. So thank you for listening to my TED talk. And um, I'm really happy to answer any question, but mostly any comments that people may have, may have seen and concerns as well. I think you just set the room on fire, Vanessa, really. Yeah, I, I don't know about other people, um, but yeah, this is a concern of privacy violations in the name of cybersecurity that happens. It's another reason why it's very important for the privacy professionals and the security professionals to be working together because yes, they're following the same rules, but the words mean different things to them, right? Yeah, I think that was fantastic. Um, Jeff is talking about the uh, Capital One Mandiant ruling on discovery and how it exposed a lot of information. It was one of the privacy violations by, by way of cyber. Um, did you wanna, do you know of this case? I don't know exactly the details of it because it's a U.S. case, so Eddie, feel free to kind of jump in. But there's that whole discussion also around the forensic data that are being obtained by these companies. And sorry for all the lawyers, but I think there's only you and me, Eddie, but we try very hard to protect this by attorney client privilege, any data that we are receiving for forensic and because we have the duty to protect our clients. Um, but in reality, that data maybe would have been useful for other things. And maybe we are hiding at things that are very important about governmental access, about, um, you know, ab about what has occurred with all of the security data, about what is there, what is not there. Um, and I, I, funny enough, I, I mean, everybody raise their hand if they have ever heard of a cybersecurity company having a data breach. Apparently, none of them are having data breach. And no law for me there. Funny, huh? Mm, no, I think it sounds like bull. So, <laughs> yeah, that sounds like bull to me. So, Jeff, you're on, you're on mute right now. But, um, Vanessa, I, I'm with you. I think we need to point out that um, lawyers, especially in this situation, need to understand, yes, we have rules of confidentiality. That has nothing to do with privacy. Yeah, it has nothing to do with privacy and cybersecurity, right? If you haven't done privacy and cybersecurity, you are, there's no way you can satisfy your obligations under the professional rules for confidentiality. That's just where I'm at. And so many lawyers have no idea. It's about time for them to start you know, having some of these issues. So I, I predict that there are lots of issues that they have shoved under their rugs. And eventually, once we have more transparency and accountability, we are going to you know, see these issues come to light. Um, but I'm going to let Jeff talk to you now about um, what you were talking about. Yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The, uh, the Capital One Mandiant ruling was a uh, was the Ninth Circuit ruling that uh, um, the cybersecurity incident report that Mandiant, I think it was maybe FireEye actually did it. <clears throat> but anyway, um, that that report that they did on the data breach at Capital One was discover discoverable by the plaintiff in a data breach lawsuit. So essentially it was causing some problems because now the question is when, when you, when you hire a, a company to come in and do discovery to figure out what happened in your data breach, if you do that in the wrong way, that information might be discoverable by the plaintiff's lawyers. Which, yeah. which I think that people... turned on the question of the report was handed in to the privacy professional that was handling it instead of through general counsel itself. So yeah, I, I think, so I you think have to be careful how you do it, right? But yeah. it's just sort of chilling on people wanting to actually figure out how their data breach happened, which is a you problem. Have to right? Follow very closely little rules, like for example, you have to make sure that you pay your forensic team out of your legal budget, not your yeah. IT budget. So there's yes. all kinds of these little rules to put in place. And this goes both ways. On one hand, my report may, may reveal a lot on my trade secret, my R&D in industries where I do not have access to patents. So that only way I can protect my technologies is to trade secret. And now I have this report going out, especially think about insider trading. And now it's going out and everybody's going to know everything about what I'm trying to build. So mm -hmm. now as a lawyer, I'm going to have to push back on them to remove stuff, which is going to impede my capacity to go to court. So there's a reason also for attorney client privilege is so that there's a full defense. And versely, hiding everything under attorney client privilege prevents actual action by government to really understand how many breaches are happening right now. Right. Uh, 
That's why we have C26 in, in Canada on the table. How many of these ransomware are happening, right? Nice. Yeah, that was one of the questions we had, Vanessa. Your thoughts about legislative efforts in Canada, the EU, UK, et cetera, that will require platforms to examine all communications, including privilege and confidential, under the guise of preventing child sexual abuse material. Right. And I think efforts is really the right the right word there, because none of these is actually going to uh, a very specific law, at least not in Canada. Um, I think the idea of informing, let's say, the Canadian Cybersecurity Center about the number and the type of attack is is worth worry. There's a reason for that. But they have to think a little bit like information exchange. They, are, they have protocols for sharing data. There are ways for making the data available, and there's a way to automate all of this as well. So if they want to do that, they want to have the information, then they have to come up with a protocol that allows to have the information while protecting the company, the trade secret, and making sure that they don't get act with the information that I give to them after. Mm. Because everybody can get act, right? Even the police that you're tra that trying to help you, even your insurer. So we don't have, and the Canadian Cyber, Secu the Canadian Cyber Exchange does have a protocol on how to share data. So why do we not have protocol society-wide on how to share data on cybersecurity? And maybe we wouldn't be there today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we have too many dark money interests that are fighting against regulation because it will slow down the data that they need for political campaigns. So that's, yeah, that's the stick in the mud today. Record spending going on as we speak right now. So yeah, right? Record spending and no absolute control over cybersecurity, I'm pretty sure over at Truth Social. So oh, well, in Canada, we just spent $55 million on Arrive Can. So we're on mm. we're, we're on the on the short listing on spending money on surveillance as well. <laughs> yeah, right. Awesome. Well, this was fantastic. I'm gonna look one last time to see, um, make sure I'm not oh, the ABA breach in Los Angeles, Jody's bringing up. Yeah, yeah, but they don't even count. Those are fake lawyers over there. That's just a lobbying group. <laughs> Mildred Lilly. Okay. So, um, right. So if there are any other questions or if you had anything else, I want to thank you for sharing all this with us, Vanessa. I know I'm going to be talking to you soon because we have to keep talking, right? There are so many things that we get into that is just awesome conversations. We can nerd out together, right? Awesome. Anytime. And if anybody feels like they need to vent about this because they feel like it's not acceptable into their business, I'm here. I have linkage. You can write to me and just vent and I'll be happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you, Vanessa.